You know, I think camp is going absolutely fantastically well. I have just been talking with so many people and just seeing all the fun that people are having, but also seeing the stuff they're learning and seeing how God is challenging people. Because you guys are on a journey, and I think it's a fantastic journey. In fact, in one sense, being a teenager can be one of the most exciting times of your life because you're on a journey to become the person that you will be for the rest of your life. But you know it can be really frustrating having to be a teenager because on that journey you're taking, everybody else is trying to mould you and shape you to become the person that they think that you should be. Come on, there's a whole lot of pressure on you, a whole lot of expectations that people have as to the sort of person they think that you should be. And there are three big pressures that every one of you has got to deal with. Here's the first one. It comes from well-meaning people like parents and teachers and sporting coaches and youth pastors. It's, it's this pressure. You've got to be successful. You've got to do well. You've got to get good marks. You've got to try hard on the field there. You've got to be as good as your brother or sister was. And while there's some good expectations there, that's a real pressure. There's people who seriously want you to be successful. And then, of course... At the same time, there's another pressure. This one comes from the media. It's there in every song that you listen to, every video clip, every TV show, every advertisement. It's the pressure to be cool. You've got to have the right gadgets. You've got to have the right gear. You've got to have the right girl. And you too, if you get the right products, you can just be the coolest kid on the block. And there's a pressure there that you've got to be cool like that. And that's a difficult pressure to live with. And at the same time, you've got to be successful, you've got to be cool. There is another pressure, and this one comes from all your friends. This is the pressure which says, be the same as us. You've got to dress like we do. You've got to like the things that we do. And, and part of you is thinking, but hang on, can't... Can't I just be me? No, you've got to be the way that we are. Otherwise, you're not getting invited to the party. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not staying for the sleepover. You've got to be exactly the same as us and don't you dare to be different because if you're different, it makes us feel insecure. And as you're going on as a teenager, all those pressures are there and I'm sure you just want to cry out at some stage and say, hang on. I just want to be me. Take the pressure off. I just want to do the things that I want to do. And I think the stage of life you're at can be really, really difficult. Because if you're asking the question, what are you meant to achieve, sometimes it's hard to work out. Everyone's got an idea of the sort of person they think you should be. But if you're thinking, what am I really meant to achieve with my life? Sometimes it's hard to work out the answer. So I went to the source of the answer. I went to the cornerstone of all wisdom in our world today. I looked it up in Wikipedia. And I discovered the things that you should expect to achieve. By the age of 12 months, and you've all arrived there, by the age of 12 months, you will have dribbled 145 litres of saliva. That's an entire bathtub full of your saliva, all by the time, age of 12 months. What about the rest of your year? What should you achieve? Here's what. In your life, you will grow 15 metres of fingernails. Quite a good, uh, if you add it up, all the time you'll spend at work in your life, it will be equal to going to work non-stop for eight continuous years. That's what you can look forward to. Three and a half years of your life will be spent eating. Yes. As a consequence of that, you'll spend six months on the toilet. I understand the figure is the same for males and females on that one. Oh, here's, here's what you'll do. By the time you have reached the end of your life, you will shed 23 kilograms of dead skin. Yes, it's coming off right now. Some of it's shaking on the person next to you. Ugh, ugh. Here's what else you can achieve. You will grow 1,000 kilometres, 1,000 kilometres of head hair. Oh, 
some of us are dragging the average down a little bit, but you get the idea. Oh, I like this one. You will grow 185 centimetres of nasal hair. Mm. Really cool. In your lifetime, you can express, you will kiss for two weeks. You will talk for 12 years. You will spend two and a half years on the phone. You will eat 7,300 eggs, consume 150 kilograms of chocolate. You will live for 79 years and then you die. And there's got to be something in there somewhere where you think, surely I'm meant to achieve something more than that. There's got to be something that you think, life is more than just achieving those things. Surely there's something that I should be achieving. And some of you right now are on top of the world. You're thinking, yes, it's going great. My life is good. I'm ready to achieve my destiny. But some of you have been knocked down so many times, you're not even sure it's worth getting up again. You're not even sure the stuff you want to achieve anymore. You're just letting life go by, turn over day after day, and you've just got knocked down so many times, it just doesn't seem like trying. A mate of mine was telling me that when he was a little boy, you know, five, six years old, he was out in the backyard helping his dad do the gardening. And the dad had put a ladder up, and he said to his little five-year-old son, he said, climb up to the top of the ladder, and the little boy climbed up. And, and the dad just walked over and said, I want you to jump from the ladder, and I'll catch you. So the little kid jumped off the ladder. The dad stepped back and let the kid just go splat on the ground. And the dad looked at the kid and said, son, let this be a lesson to you. Never trust anyone. Can you imagine what he would go through life thinking? And maybe you've been hurt somewhere along the way. Maybe somebody lets you down. Maybe somebody hurts you and you're not even sure you can trust anyone. And if life is a journey, some of you are thinking you don't even want to take one more step. But my belief is that this morning you might discover a step that you haven't yet taken. My prayer is that this morning you will discover a step which can change the destiny and the eternity of your life. My prayer is today, as we look at what God has to say, you will discover a step that God wants you to take today. When I look in the Bible today, I want to go back to our old friend Peter. And I want to look at a turning point in his life where he discovered a step that he needed to take that was going to have the most remarkable change on him forever. I'm calling it the step of faith, but before we get to the step of faith, there's a number of other steps that have to happen. Let me set the scene. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 14, and I'm starting at verse 22. Here's the deal. Jesus had sent the disciples off in the boat to go to the other side of Lake Galilee. Jesus has stayed behind to pray. This is what it says, Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So have you got the picture? The disciples are out in the boat crossing Lake Galilee. Jesus is not with them and this storm has whipped up. The waves are coming over. The wind is blowing and these experienced fishermen are terrified for their life. But here's the deal. They're having this really step of despair. They're having this moment that's tricky for them and Jesus is not with them. And I don't know whether you've got into difficulties. You've been in situations that have seemed a little bit hopeless and it's honestly felt to you like Jesus is not with you. Well, Jesus is about to do something for his disciples to let them know that they will never be alone. Let's now look at the step of Jesus. This is verse 25. 
during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. Now, if you've ever seen this in sort of Bruce Almighty, there's like this crystal clear lake, almost like a mirror, perfectly calm, and there's Jesus walking on the water. You've got to understand it was nothing like that. There was a violent storm going on. The waves are coming up, the wind is howling, the storm is big enough for experienced fishermen to be in fear of their life. And somehow Jesus is miraculously walking on top of this water. Now the cynics amongst you will be thinking, oh yeah, it was really shallow. You know, there was like a sandbar just underneath the water and Jesus was walking out on the sand. Can I tell you, the water was deep enough that experienced fishermen were terrified for their life as the winds and the waves howled around them. Hey, when I was in Israel with Carly, we went out on a boat in, in Lake Galilee. It is a big lake, and if you were stuck in the middle of that, you are a long, long way from land. But here is Jesus appearing. Now, I don't know what's going on in the disciples' minds, but I would be absolutely freaked out if in the middle of the night I saw a man walking on the top of stormy water. This is what verse 26 says. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And I think I would have freaked out as well. But Jesus immediately calms them down. Verse 27 Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Now, if you were Peter, what would you do? At this stage, what would you do? Come on. Um, I'm sure Peter could say something like, oh Jesus, it's so jolly nice of you to come out and visit us. You know, we're sort of in a spot of bother here. Thank you for coming out. That's very nice. I tell you what, uh, while you're here, my good friend, uh, why don't you sort of stop the storm? That would be really preachy. Okay, uh, and how about you stop freaking us out and, you know, get into the boat with us. And um, look, we're rearing all the way to the other side and it's really hard work. Uh, you reckon you could snap your fingers and we'll just automatically be propelled to the other side. And while you're at it, Jesus, we're kind of hungry. Uh, you remember the loaves and fishes? We could do with some McValue meals right now. So if you wouldn't be so kind, Jesus, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, please just look after us. You know, so many people think that following Jesus is getting him to do things for you. Getting him to make life easier. Getting him to make life more comfortable. Getting him to make life more successful for you. And some people, when they say they want to become Christians, all they want to do is have Jesus run around like their little servant, mopping up the messes in their life, to make them more comfortable, to give them more money, to get them a girlfriend. Hey, you've got to understand, following Jesus is nothing like that. Following Jesus is not him doing stacks of things for you and making your life better. Following Jesus means taking a step of faith into very scary territory. Following Jesus means you're going to go wherever Jesus takes you. Following Jesus means you're going to do whatever Jesus says. And some of you are thinking, that's a step I have never actually made. And today I want to give you an opportunity to take that step a little later. Let's now look at the step of faith. Verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter is saying, Lord, if you're out there in scary territory, I want to be with you. Peter is saying, Lord, if you're out there in the storms of life, I want to be with you. And he takes that step which changes everything. In verse 29, Jesus says to Peter, Come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Now, can you understand a miracle is happening right in front of Peter's eyes? He is now walking on top of those storms. Jesus is supporting him somehow. A miracle is changing things. Now, can you note what Jesus hasn't done yet? He hasn't stopped the storm. Does that make sense? 
The storm is still raging. And sometimes when things are going wrong, you just say, Jesus, stop the storm in my life. And sometimes Jesus says, the storm is going to rage a little while longer, but I'm going to guarantee to support you and I'm guaranteeing to hold your hand and to take you everywhere you want to go. And because Peter took this step of faith to trust Jesus, a miracle happened in his life. He is now rising above his storms. He is walking on the water. Now let's just freeze frame that for a moment. All Peter's got to do is finish the story there. He's taken the step of faith. The miracle has happened. He's walking on the water. He is the hero of the moment. Come on, all he's got to do is keep his eyes on Jesus, get Jesus back in the boat, go back to the land. He can start the first church of the holy water walkers. He can be the pin-up boy. Here is the guy who trusted Jesus. Everything is going brilliantly well for him. Until he looks around at how big the waves are. He feels how powerful the wind wind is. He sees the storm rising and he realises he's just walking on top of it. And just for a moment, he takes his eyes off Jesus and starts looking at how bad his storm is. Verse 30. When Peter saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. You see, when he takes his eyes off Jesus, he suddenly realises nothing holding him up. You ever seen the cartoons, you know, Coyote and Roadrunner, they're going through the desert, they're running, running, running. They run off the edge of a cliff but they haven't realised they've run off the edge of the cliff and they're just running up in mid-air. Nothing's holding them up. They're just up there and suddenly... They look down and go, "Uh uh-oh, and straight down they go. It's a little like that with Peter. He is walking on the water. Nothing is holding him up. With his eyes on Jesus, with his focus on Jesus, he can't see how powerful his storm is. But when he focuses on the storm, he can't see how powerful Jesus is. And he starts to sink because he's at the mercy of the storms that are starting to overwhelm him. Now, I know that in your life, things are going to go wrong. There's going to be storms that rage in your life. There's going to be people who hurt you and people who let you down and things that just go wrong. There's going to be pressure on you and expectations and you're going to feel like you've failed. And I want to tell you, when you keep your focus on Jesus, you won't be able to see how powerful your storms are. But when you put your focus on your storms, you're not going to be able to see how powerful Jesus is. And maybe today is the day where God is calling on you to simply change your focus. Stop looking at the things that are dragging you down and seeing how big they are. Start looking at Jesus and seeing how powerful he is. Because the stuff of life can simply overwhelm you. The hurt that you'll get sometimes, it just feels like it's too much. Sometimes we just want Jesus to get rid of the storm. And he can do that. But so many times what he says is that storm will rage for just a little while. But I'm going to be with you. And together we can step into your future. Together we can step into your life. Together we will step into your eternity. And Jesus says to you, I will never let you go. Well, as Peter's taken that step of doubt, as he is sinking, he suddenly realises he needs help. Verse 30 again. When Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why 
did you doubt? Does it make sense the moment that Peter realises he can't do it by himself? The moment he reaches out to grab Jesus and to ask Jesus to save him, Jesus reaches down and hauls him way above his storms so that together they can walk into his future. And the same is true now. Come on, I know in my life, I try to do things myself, under my own strength, you know, impress God with how good I am, and I just start sinking. And I don't know where you've got to in your life. Maybe you come along here every week to Crossfire, join in our camps, you agree with all the stuff, but maybe you've never taken the step of reaching your hand out and saying, Jesus, I'm going to trust my whole life to you. And I'll tell you why you can do that with confidence. Because when Jesus died on that cross, it was like God reached down from heaven with his hand to grab hold of anybody who was prepared to place their faith and trust in Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross, any sin that you had, any failings that you had, anything that would weigh you down and drown you, anything that would stop you becoming the person that God wanted you to be, Jesus took the whole lot off you. Every sin you could possibly ever commit, he put the whole lot on himself and said, you are forgiven. No longer. Your storms don't have to overwhelm you anymore. Sure, you might feel the pain of it, but they are not stronger than you. I have taken them. Every wrong thing you've ever done, every time you've let somebody down, every time you have hurt someone, every time you have said to God, I don't need your help, I'm doing it my way. Every time you've deliberately gone and done stuff which you know is wrong, when Jesus dies on the cross, he says, I'm taking that sin, I'm wresting it away from you, and I'm going to suffer the punishment that you deserve. And when he burst out of that tomb three days later, he said, I can now give you eternal life and you can live with God forever in heaven. I just wonder where you're at in your journey right now. Because every step that you take takes you in a direction. And some of you are taking good steps, steps which are taking you closer to being the person that God wants you to be. But you know that some of you are taking steps away from Jesus, just going along for the ride and moving right away from the magnificent future that Jesus has planned for you. I wonder this morning whether some of you are sitting back comfortably in the boat just watching Jesus walk by. Here you are at camp. You come to Crossfire, you come to church, you're in a Bible study, you're interested, you're great, you're fantastic, but you're comfortable. You're just watching Jesus walk by and you're just saying, Jesus, make my boat more comfortable. You could have gone along with the whole Jesus thing but never taken the step out of the boat to go into the scary territory where Jesus says, you have to trust me. And it might just be that today, God is nudging you to say, today I want you to take that step. Maybe today God is saying to you, step out of your comfortable boat. Step out into the scary territory. Step out and take Jesus' hand and step forward into the rest of your life. And the Bible promises that when you give your life to Jesus, he takes you by the hand, he forgives you of every sin, he wipes away anything that could stop you achieving what he wants you to achieve, and he takes you all the way to heaven. And wouldn't it be fantastic in years to come, you might look back at this beach camp and say, you know, that was the day 
I took that step of faith. Not a little step that I'm going to backtrack from in a week's time, but a step that I will never turn away because I want to move forward and belong to Jesus and become God's child. How do you take that step? It's exactly the same as Peter. You reach out to Jesus and you say, Lord, save me. You simply talk to him. You let him know that by yourself you're drowning. You let him know that you don't want to live life without him. You, you let him know that you've let him down, that you have sinned and you need his help. Then you ask him to forgive you for everything by his death on the cross. Then you ask him to give you the gift of eternal life because he rose from the dead. And then you take the step. You take the step which says, Lord, I'm going to commit my life to following you. I'm going to go wherever you take me and for the rest of my days, I'm going to live it with you in charge. And maybe today is the day that you take that step. I'm going to pray the sort of prayer that a person would pray if they wanted to become a Christian. If you wanted to say to Jesus, Lord, I've listened to you, I've heard about you, but I've never taken the step of following you. I'm going to pray the sort of prayer that a person would pray. And I'm going to invite you that if you want to take that step, take my words of my prayer and you make them your words. You don't have to say them out loud. You say them from your heart right to the Spirit of God and he will hear you. I'm going to pray it in sort of short half sentences and have a small pause so that you have the time to then echo those words and make it your prayer. And if you really mean what you're about to pray on the basis of what God says in the Bible, I guarantee you that he will hear your prayer and that he will answer it. Can we now pray together? And I'm going to lead us in the prayer of a person who wants to take the step of faith. And if you know that God is nudging you to take that step, take my words, make them yours, and talk directly to God. Let's pray. Dear God, I know I try and live without you. I know I do the wrong thing. I need your help. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Please wipe away every one of my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead. Please give me the gift of eternal life. Lord, today I want to take that step of faith. I want to give my whole life into your hands. Lord, take control of my life. I want to live the rest of my days following you. Amen. Can I just say to you, if you prayed that prayer just then, God heard it. And if you have actually asked God, to give you that eternal life, he has already answered it. If you were genuine just then, he has already taken you from being his enemy and made you into his friend. You've already become a child of God. Your eternity's been changed. You're now going to heaven and you have a whole lifetime ahead of you to learn how to live for Jesus. And you've taken that first step, the vital step, But that's the first step of a lifelong journey. And we are your community. We want to help you take every step. 
so you don't fall away, so you don't give up, so you become a stronger Christian and you learn how to help other people take that step. So in a moment as we sing a final cry to God in song, if you've prayed that prayer, I want you to take a very bold step, a very brave step, that while we're singing, I want you to leave your seats and come out the front and praise God from out here as a public way of saying, from today, my life is going to be different. And then we can know who you are, we can help you, and we can enfold you into the forever community of God's children. So in a moment when we sing our last song, if you want to say yes to Jesus for the very first time and to publicly show that you're going to follow him from this day, then get out of your seat and come and stand at the front. If you sort of made a commitment way back, but you know you haven't stuck to it, and today you want to come back, then you come and join us as well. Not to come back and then give up again, but to come back and say, I am sticking with it this time and nothing will shake me. Or maybe you're not sure. You sort of think you're a Christian, but you're really not sure you've ever taken the step. I want to say, come and make sure. Come and find out. Today, God is calling you to make an, a, a step, a step of faith, which can change everything. Please stand to your feet. Let's join in as we sing out to God. And as we're singing, you come out and make a stand for Jesus. say to everyone who's come out the front I don't know what's going on in your life right now and every one of you is different some of you are becoming Christians and saying today I'm going to follow Jesus and I've never done that some of you are coming back because there was sort of a commitment before that didn't work out and some of you are just coming to ask questions we want to treat you as absolute individuals and even while I'm just talking to you, if you know that God is nudging you to come and join us, just come and join us while I'm standing here talking with these people. What I want to do in just a moment, in a moment I'll get you to sit down because I want to pray for these people and just chat to them for a moment and I'm just going to ask you to stay there quietly while I do it. But I want to pray for these people first and can you join in praying for your brothers and sisters who are taking this step? And even while we're doing it, if you know you're meant to be out here, then come out and join us. Let's pray. I want to pray for everyone who's taken that bold step today. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I pray for every individual who's taking a step of faith today. Thank you that your son is powerful, that he died on that cross and he rose from the grave. And Father, we rejoice that today miracles are happening in people's lives. Father, for every single person, help this to be a day that they will never turn back from. Help this to be a day where they will step forward in your love for the rest of their days. Thank you that you save people, that you rescue people, and that we get to build your community here on planet Earth. Father God, you are awesome, and we praise you for your power this morning. Amen.